Nga waka e nga awa e nga maunga o te matu tēnā katoa katoa tēnā katoa e rotoa e nga mihi ki a kini tuhetia me te araki whānui E rā rangatira mā unho mahi o te whare wānanga e te whakaminenga tēnā katoa tēnā ratata katoa Good evening, my name is Neil Quigley. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Wakaro. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening um, to this inaugural lecture for Professor Graham Dawn. Inaugural lectures are a way uh, of acknowledging the, point, the appointment of new professors uh, and giving them an opportunity to share their research interests uh, with their colleagues and members of the community. Professor Graham Dawes is one of New Zealand's leading environmental economists and an expert in analysing the complex relationship between agriculture and water. He holds a professorial position at the university and that is jointly funded both by the Waikato Management School and the Ministry for the Environment. Graham grew up on a sheep and beef farm in the Taihapi region of the central North Island. He has a bachelor's degree in agricultural science and a master's in natural resource economics from Massey University and a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Western Australia. Graham's connection with the University of Waikato dates back to 2010 when he became a part-time senior lecturer in the economics department while continuing to work as associate professor of environmental economics at the University of Western Australia. He was named the top young agronomist by the Australian Society of Agronomy in November 2010, and in 2012 he was a finalist in the Kudos Awards for Hamilton Science Excellence. Graham has spent the past decade researching cost-effective measures to reduce the environmental footprint of farming on both sides of the Tasman. The primary focus of his research has been reducing levels of contaminants into waterways, while at the same time helping farmers to be more productive. Quote Graham, that's good for everybody, and that's, of course, uh, what economics uh, is about. A key aspect of Graham's role is to act as a senior advisor to the Ministry for the Environment on water management issues. He provides insights into the economic impact of new policies to improve the water quality of New Zealand's rivers, lakes and streams, and balancing that against the economic benefits of agriculture. Graham's research has been used to guide decisions regarding the management of Lake Rotorua, management of the Waikato and Waipa River catchments, and water allocation and storage options throughout New Zealand. Graham has published across a broad range of subject areas. Most of his recent publications examine issues such as the trade-offs between profit, production, and environmental footprint on dairy farms in the Waikato region, improving the profitability of Waikato dairy farms, managing greenhouse gas emissions in two major dairy regions, and evaluating scenarios for water quality in the Waikato and Waipa River catchments. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, will you please welcome to give his inaugural professorial lecture, Professor Graham Hill. And before I start, firstly, I'd like to thank the uh, I'd like to thank the University of Waikato for their strong support in this position, uh, for supporting the chair of environmental economics here at the University of Waikato, and also the Ministry for the Environment. Uh, I believe my manager Vera Power is here tonight, and without her vision, this uh, position wouldn't uh, wouldn't have happened, wouldn't have come to fruition. And uh, that's one thing I have noticed about you know that's one core thing that I've really enjoyed. I work with the government role especially the Ministry for the Environment embrace a very strong uh, ethic of novel ways of thinking and trying to uh, really uh, work together to try and solve our environmental problems at the, uh, at the regional and national scales. So you know I've been privileged to really uh, would really kind of encourage, really hone my practice and I've evolved a lot uh, as an economist you know, through that uh, work as an advisor. Uh, for the last two years, but especially in the last year in this position. So I hope, hope you might see the name of the topic there up on the screen. Uh, it's a bit of a funny, uh, my old dirt new boots seem like a funny, bit of a funny title, but really what it comes down to 
is that you know new ways of thinking about old problems. Uh, you know, one of my friends asked me today. He said, you know, how do uh, how do I tell you if, if if you're not doing a good job during the uh, good job during the lecture? How do I tell you that? Uh, how do I tell you that that I don't think they're going that well? He goes, maybe I'll just throw things less hard this time. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> but you know, and I don't know whether it's a bad omen or what. But really, really, what I'm trying to talk about to today is about a journey. You know, uh, when we talk about old and new, we're talking about a journey through time. We're talking about quite a strong journey of time. And I think about, if we go right back to 1986, I went to Taipei Primary School, which in the modern terminology is known as a decile one school. And I was the bottom, I think I was in standard four, and I was the bottom of the class. I was going to school to eat my lunch. And I, remember, <laughs> I literally was, I remember thinking, you know, why do we have to do this other stuff? I want to play soccer and play rugby and things. But, you know, and I'm from a sheep farm, we've got an old homestead there, and there's an old sliding door between our lounge and our dining room. And I remember I was watching the old black and white TV in the lounge and with a sliding door closed, my parents were in the other room and I remember my father, uh, my mother saying to my father, she said, what, you know, what the hell are we going to do with this boy, you know? <laughs> and I remember my father saying, you know, he just he, he didn't know what was going to go on. He said, uh, he said, we just, you know, he's uh, not doing very well at school. They're talking about putting him to a special school and things. And my father said, you know, have you ever seen this guy try and write because it's not legible? You know, <laughs> and so my mother said, I remember my, hearing my mother say, uh, yeah, but you know, that still doesn't fix it, what are we going to do? And I remember my father saying, he goes, I don't know what we're going to do, but how about tomorrow I sit down with him for 20, 30 minutes and we start writing out some stuff, get him, instead of trying to write two pages in a short time, let's flip and try and, let's try and slow him down, let his brain work a bit. So I remember the next day, my father sat me down at the table, sat on one corner, I sat on the other. And he said, write slowly. And the football was painful, about 20 minutes to do five lines, if I remember. And I was writing about the Olympics out of an old encyclopedia from 1975. And, you know, that was it. And that was the next night I did the same thing. My father was there as well. And then after a while, my father kind of lost the enthusiasm a bit. I remember him just delegating it to me, go and be your writing boy. And, do you know, that was the start. You know, that was a small step. But uh, four years later, I was the ducks in the school. Uh, once I, you know, after I started writing, I actually became interested in what was in the encyclopedia, started reading broadly, and I became quite interested. And then, you know, 30 years later, after that small step, 30 years later now, standing here giving an inaugural professorial lecture, you know, so really it was a journey, and the journey's not finished by any means, like, you know, just turn 40, uh, turn, just become a professor. And I think, you know, but even though there is steps on the journey to come, you know, I have been through quite, quite a big journey, I think, but it started with a small step, you know, just, uh, just my father and mother saying, what the hell are we gonna do, and wanted to do things differently. And you know, and I think that's really, what my talk is about today is really about time and journeys and steps, and small, small and secure steps on those journeys. Um, and such a journey we see as actually in our, our national journey, which I think is one of the most interesting journeys that, um, I'm, that I'm interested in. You know, Sir George Sackleton back in 1926, he was the top scientist in the, uh, in the British Empire at the time. And, and he, he made quite a bold statement. He said, grassland equally with the sea is to be regarded as one of the cornerstones on which the greatness of the British Empire has been built. And you know, at the time, the British uh, Imperial Navy for the, you know, and for the years previous was actually a very strong, potent force. However, what he was saying is that really, we, uh, through ryegrass and white clover, they were the seeds of an empire. And there's recently been a book about five or six years ago, it was called Seeds of an Empire, which was all about the spread of ryegrass and white clover and how, how the development of these colonial powers was based on grazing animals. And so right from the start, we see in our national journey just you know, quite a strong um, essence of pastoralism and that colonial dominance over the landscape. And not only is it a national journey, it's a bit of a personal journey as well. Uh, this man here, I, I know it's a bit of a hard photo to see, but it was taken on an iPhone, I think, and the iPhones aren't as good as the Samsung's. But, the, uh, but that's my great-great-grandfather. So my grandfather's grandfather's name was John Dorman. He came here, uh, fought the mutiny in India in 1862, I think it was, and then he came here and fought at Gate Park, uh, did well to survive Gate Park. And this was a photo was taken in the Taranaki at one of the uh, celebrations, you know, to say, you know, we lived through the war. But, you know, he came and after that he started farming Romney sheep in about 1865 after the war finished uh, in the Taihebi region. And then after that, 
uh, basically we're still doing the same thing 150 years later. So it's our, part of our family farm there, which my grandfather farmed, my father farmed. Uh, you know, what we see there is that it's not only a national journey of agriculture and real strong reliance on a grazing animal, it's also a bit of a personal journey. And I'm, you know, I always love feeling it, you know, I always love just uh, thinking about that journey. You know, it's kind of a, when I'm dealing with it in my work, I'll, you know, I love cut, uh, having that background, having that, uh, having that basis of my work, you know, because we are tied to that journey that our nation's been through. However, you know, when we do have journeys, there are the good part, the good times and the bad times. Uh, we're a small open economy, and one of the things that we've, one of the things that we see on on when we're reliant on commodities, uh, on the production of a lot of commodities within a small open economy, is we see a high degree of volatility. So a few years ago, I was working uh, with some people from Dairy and Z, and one of the top scientists at Dairy and Z, he said the price will never be below six dollars. Don't bother, you know, evaluating these plans and, um, if the price goes under six dollars. I think a year later it went down to four dollars something, you know, and <laughs> which was a half. I think it went from eight twenty to four twenty or something like that. And so we see that volatility. And I was on a plane recently, and there was a guy there from the manuka honey industry. He was one of the big people, and he said, "This is a manuka honey." He told me it was the only industry that's recession proof. He said, You're, "It's got high. Uh, we've got high prices in there at the moment." He said, "It's, you know, impossible to fail." And I think, you know, I, I just I, I didn't quite trust him. I think if we look at uh, the dairy industry, the goat, uh, the goat industry, emus, ostriches, water buffalo, uh, American Suffolk. You know, if we look back in time, we do know that our commodity cycles uh, do go up and down. Uh, another negative aspect, really, of having our agriculture, of having uh, having a strong reliance on the grazing animal within our economy, um, is the fact that when we intensify our land, we we actually lose some contaminants from our land. So you think that a lot of this land, for example, we've got about 1.1 million hectares of agricultural land across the Waikato. Historically, a lot of that was swamp land or native forest, uh, or native forest with very low, uh, with very low contaminant losses to water. However, now what we see is a very, uh, we've taken a lot of that away, and now we've placed a, a quite, you know, quite of that colonial landscape, that grassland landscape, and it's become highly productive, very highly productive highly profitable as well. But in doing that, we've increased the contaminant load, so the, the losses of materials we lose to water has increased. And so we get intensification. So right now on New Zealand sheep farms, we see uh, cropping of, you know, some using tractor, tractor cropping some quite steep land. And so we can get soil erosion from that land. Uh, on some sheep and beef land, they spray large steep hillsides during, uh, during early summer. Well, we're saying class seven hill country, where class eight is basically we can't, we shouldn't be grazing class eight land. It's, you know, it's the very steep stuff. But on the class seven land, they're planting crops on there through spraying it by helicopter, uh, seeding it, and then hoping that it rains. And that's why it's called spray and pray agriculture. <laughs> but, you know, you know, you see the spray and pray agriculture. Like recently, I went horse riding, and we went horse riding through a whole landscape with about 100 or 200 hectares of spray and pray, which was just bare, denuded uh, hillsides like this. But in November, which is the, the hills were about twice as steep. And you know, just when we look at that, it's just, you know, sometimes you think, aren't we better than that? And uh, another thing we have, you know, I'm working with a bit of investment at the moment, what we see throughout the hill country there is we've got high, uh, you know, we've, we've taken the big trees and we've taken their roots that anchor the, off that land. And so these land with very, these, this landscape with very soft soil, very fragile soils, high rainfall and steep gradient, uh, if you get enough water, the soil becomes very heavy and washes off. So we get erosion, and you can see in the background there, extensive erosion down that uh, side lane. Uh, another thing is by virtue of our landscape is that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of, it's heavily dissected, which by means of there's a lot of valleys through there. So we find a lot of streams which are flowing for all part of the year. And so because it's very hard to fence all of them, we, we often have quite a high connection between the livestock, uh, between the livestock and the waterway. And this can lead to enrichment with nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, and also fecal microbes are a large one, uh, such as E. coli, Campylobacter, Jardia, and also uh, sediment as well. We can have stream bank erosion. So when the large, you know, when the large heavy animal stands on the side of the stream, it can push dirt directly into there. So that's another thing on our journey towards improving uh, economic outcomes for the region and the nation. We're actually placing pressure on our uh, 
on our walkways at the same time. And the reason why this is a problem, of course, is that you know tourism now is one of the most important industries uh, within the economy. But also, as you know, as New Zealanders ourselves, we we feel very connected to the waterways, so we really enjoy uh, swimming and rowing and the swimming and rowing, for example. So this picture here is of Lake Karapiro, where they, um, you know, they held the world champs there for rowing a few years ago. It's used every year, um, used every year for that purpose. A lot of people fish in there as well. Uh, and so as we find, as we find the input of nutrients, uh, the input of contaminants into those waterways, it can affect the way we interact with it. For example, I go fishing off the head of the dam here for trout, but as soon as it comes about October, November, I have to stop because there's so much weed growing in it that it catches my line. Uh, you know, I lose about $10 worth of spinners every time I go in, uh, in there in October and November, so I stop doing it. But we've got, we've got to the stage where we actually use a physical removal of the weed in there, and the reason, of re the reason that the algae grows in there is because the dams slow the water down and it has time for the uh, water which is enriched with nitrogen and phosphorus to grow these nuisance algae species. Uh, another example of sediment. So this is the Waipo River in Brisbane. Uh, 18 million tonnes of sediment a year uh, going into the sea. You know, that's, I think that's about 10, about 10% of New Zealand's total sediment load, but 18 million tonnes a year, you know, it's, it's significant. So, and that's because of our, you know, our extensive forest camps all over that pastoral land. And sediment's a problem, of course, because if we go swimming, we can't see in front of us. Uh, at the same time, it carries phosphorus, which, we, which can lead to algae, algal enrichment. Uh, but also, it can uh, change the way that rivers uh, react in response to flood, etc. Uh, also, we have microbial, uh, microbial problems. So some of you would have heard uh, recently right in the news right now, there's Campylobacter. Um, Campylobacter poisoning in the, in the Hawke's Bay region. Uh, but even in our rivers, there are some places which are deemed unsafe, to, unsafe for swimmability due to uh, high levels of E. coli, which is an indicator for those bugs that make you sick, more like Campylobacter, Jardia, and Cryptosporidium. So if we see in the, if we, this graph here shows us the sites that are deemed swimmable or unswimmable. In the Upper Waikato River, it's very pristine. Lake Taupo is very pristine itself. So we have a very, it's very safe to swim there. And then down, that dilution effect also carries down to the lower Waikato River. So we have about, uh, but still there's more than 60% of sites are unswimmable. However, in these tributaries in the lower Waikato and Waipa, we see that there is a very high um, number of sites that are unswimmable. So here we've got about 97% of sites in the lower Waikato are unsafe to swimming due to microbial loads. Some of them are arising from human, you know, septic tanks, etc. But a lot of them is are from um, low, uh, from fecal loads of livestock. I think a single, I think a single uh, cow pack contains about a billion E. coli. So, you know, it's so that connection between stock and the waterways is important. And if we're valuing our swimming, you know, I think New Zealand is starting to recognise, and the government's really responded to it. I think as well that really strong focus on trying to improve. Uh, water quality within our nation. You know, a really, you know, the blessing or the happy side of the story is that we actually have a lot of technologies available to improve the, uh, to reduce the amount of contaminants lost from our, uh, lost from our agricultural land. So if we look back to the, uh, you know, for the, since the 50s and 60s, there's been a strong soil conservation movement in New Zealand. We see uh, planting trees, planting, uh, planting willows or poplars, uh, on on broad hillscapes to hold the to stop soil erosion, uh, we have sediment traps to capture the sediment coming down the streamways to stop them going further through the uh, flow network. We have afforestation in parts. So here we have pine forest. Here we have pine forest. We see this pine forest really holding up the uh, holding up the hillsides. So in times. Uh, so in, part, in parts of the country where we have high erosion losses, you know, we see a movement back towards uh, full afforestation. And also we have uh, stream bank fencing as well to, to keep the stock out of the waterways. Uh, this is amazing to see at the moment. Like I go to work in Gisborne quite a bit, go for a run in the morning, and you just, it's amazing. You see these logging trucks about every, or oh, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, you just see a logging truck coming past. 
And I, it feels, you know, it feels really amazing because they're, they're carrying this product that's been grown on the land and you just think, you know, every time that's going to the port, they're filling up another, filling up another uh, large logging boat and that's really good for the regional economy. And it's quite amazing to see that. But somebody told me at the district council this, in the same day that that's actually, uh, they were what they call cyclone bowler forests. They planted those trees there uh, after cyclone bowler to hold the hillsides there. So what we're actually doing 28, 30 years later is actually taking down those forests that have held those soils for 30 years. And so they're expecting some more, uh, some more erosion over the next five or six years until the new forest starts to root the, you know, starts to hold the ground through its root, root, root anchors. So you know, so we do actually have these technologies, and these technologies, uh, the most effective technologies, are what are uh, actually different from you know how a lot of people perceive uh, mitigation, mitigations or abatement practices to reduce contaminant loss. What they, what they're, they're, they're examples of what economists actually call capital. So when we talk about capital, we mean something long-lasting or durable, something that we can invest, can invest in. So sometimes when we talk about reducing nitrogen leaching, for example, or nitrogen loss from farms, what we talk about is we can reduce nitrogen fertilizer and that will reduce uh, loss of nitrogen by some component. But a lot of the mitigations are actually capital, they are actually durable and long-lasting. So this fence here, we build it, probably going to last 15 years, maybe 30 years. Uh, if we put these trees here, they're probably there for 30 years. Uh, if we put a sediment trap in there, if we maintain it, it will last you know, uh, 30, 40 years. If we don't, it'll probably last maybe 10 or 20. But the thing is, is that what's really important is that they're durable, they're long lasting, they're there, they're there, for, uh, they're there for a certain length of time. And that is really the, uh, core of what I'm trying to talk about today, like I've spoken uh, earlier on in the lecture, I spoke about journeys and policy journeys. And really what I'm trying to identify here is that a big problem with the way that we've been interpreting the economic analysis of water quality improvement in New Zealand is that we've forgot about time, is that somewhere along here we've lost the truth, we've actually lost our ability to think of our mitigations as capital. And also by doing that we've actually gone away from adoptability. So that's the rest of my talk, is will be based around what I mean by that. So if, if we've been to the South Island, if any of you have been to the South Island recently, driven through Otago, through Southland, through Canterbury, over the last 20 to 30 years what we've seen is a very significant change in the landscape. Where we had Romney sheep and some of the best sheep studs in New Zealand, what we now have is uh, very intensive dairy farms. And a lot of that is uh, thanks to irrigation. So the fact that we can now grow grass in places where it's traditionally too dry to do so. On some of these farms, grass growth has gone from 8 tonnes per year to 21 tonnes per year uh, because now we can have that water in a dry place. What we're seeing is very rapid adoption of this capital. So irrigation capital is very long lasting. What we've had is very high adoption of that and very rapid adoption of that. And the reason why we've had rapid adoption of that is because it offers a lot to the farming system itself. It offers security, it offers uh, higher production, it offers profit, uh, it also raises the value of your land. And so within that, we've actually experienced quite rapid uptake uh, of farm, uh, on farm. And the thing, that we, the thing that I think really, in terms of environmental quality, is that where I think our farming system design is we're missing something, is that we're not getting such rapid adoption of practices that are environmentally focused or conservation focused. And I, think, uh, and I think that also because we don't focus on adoptability, um, I think it also changes the way that we perceive the economic analysis of these problems. So when we look at our standard way we perform economic analysis in New Zealand can basically be shown on this graph. So here we have profit up here, so that's if we're making positive money is above the line. If we're making negative money, we're losing money, it's down here. And if we have environmental benefits, it's along this uh, axis here. So options here uh, have low environmental benefit and they're increasing out here, so we have high environmental benefits here. Often what we'll do as economists is identify where different options sit on this, uh, on this axis and how high. So one example could be, for example, we might, have, we might be able to get some part of the way, some environmental benefit by doing something that's very good for farm income. One example is improving the way that we utilise, uh, utilize, improving the way that we utilise winter crops on farms. And so that one there, option one has positive profit, 
and it's to do with some small change in efficiency of our farming system. Uh, and if we conduct a standard economic analysis, we'll go through and we usually identify uh, two or three other scenarios. And what we usually find generally is that as we go, as we look at contaminant, trying to reduce contaminant loss, uh, if we try and reduce contaminant loss by more than 10%, what we find is that we start to lose uh, money. And especially at the other end for option four, we start to, what we start to see is quite high uh, environmental benefits, but that's usually associated with quite high costs because we might have to do some land use change back to the pasture, back to production or pasture, for example. And so this is the standard way that, uh, standard way that economists in New Zealand perceive the water quality problem. Uh, but the thing is, what, what we look at that is actually highly static, what an economist would call static. It's a single point in time. But really, these options have different, have different pathways uh, to their introduction. So to move a landscape to a point where we attain higher environmental benefits, one where we have uh, quite significant areas of production forestry or native forest, uh, is very difficult. That pathway is quite long, quite protracted, whereas if we're trying to improve efficiency on the farm, it can be quite uh, short, it can be quite targeted. But you know, really, uh, if we look across New Zealand, we don't see a very strong focus on how best to stage that transition. And that's what I'm thinking is that, you know, really the lens that we're missing is the, what I call the adoptability lens, is that when we think about these alternative practices, when we think about the menu of choices, what we're forgetting about is the pathway. So it's almost envisaging that if we're doing the evaluation is that this is a pathway. So we might be aiming for four, but we might actually start at one and just work our way down. However, economic, economics in a standard form is not doing that presently. And I think, you know, and I think by doing that, we're actually missing some of the uh, important insights. I think a good way of showing this is what, uh, is a sophisticated framework known as the Kane Quadrant. Uh, it's not that sophisticated, which is good. Uh, really, it's a relationship between profit and loss is on there. So if it's above this line, if it's above this line, we're making money. If it's below the line, we're losing money. If it's to the right of this point here, it's, very, it's getting more and more complex. If it's to the left of this line, it's simple. Uh, what we're looking for really when we're trying, what I think is that by focusing on highly adoptable actions, if we focus, when, we, when we're trying to design our policy journey, if we focus on adoptable actions, what we can do is that there's a really uh, strong place there to reduce our enforcement costs, uh, gain positive momentum, and it really uh, breaks down, it really breaks down the opportunity for resistance. I think working with people, uh, I think there's an amazing opportunity to work with people, uh, work with industries and work with farmers to actually really get some momentum on envi for environmental improvement. And really where that sits is in this part of the graph. If we have profitable and simple technologies for improving the environment, uh, and we can rely on that to spread throughout the landscape, so we have a diffusion across the landscape, uh, then I think that is really, uh, is really an easy solution if we can develop solutions like that. Uh, farmers will be more willing to uptake those type of technologies. Uh, whereas there are other options, if we're, if we're trying to make farmers do things which are complex, and do things which make them lose money, then really that's a difficult way for a policy journey. We're not getting that uptake, you know, and what we find that's an area of strong resistance as well. So I've seen in a couple of processes now where uh, people have been very keen on imposing quite strict environmental uh, regulations and the industry has said, no, uh, let's push it out. You know, that is a very, uh, and that is because sometimes that policy as we aim for uh, that place, as we aim for that place, uh, it's not actually very good on, on the ground, so to speak. And sometimes also there's scope up in the northeast quadrant where it may be profitable but also it might be complex. And I think we can learn, you know, in the environmental sphere, I think we can actually take a lot from the production, uh, from the, what we observe in the production sphere. So. This is, a, this is a photo of my father looking cows when he was eight years old, I think it was 1954, he might be in the crowd, he might be able to tell me the year better. But if we try to milk 2,000 cows in Canterbury right now using that, it's simple, you know, it's pretty easy to milk a cow by hand, I can never do it, it's one thing that I always struggle with. But uh, it is actually pretty simple, 
But the thing is that to milk 2,000 cows like that is uh, you're probably losing money. Uh, but, but in terms of milking 2,000 cows, what we see now is actually some new technologies coming available. This is an automatic milking system. So some people call it the robot milker. The cow milks in by itself whenever it wants. Uh, the machine comes out, places the, tents, uh, places the uh, milking machine on the tents, uh, harvests the milk. At the end of the day, you get an email in your inbox about how much uh, milk Daisy 1 and Daisy 2 have produced today. And it's much easier on the cow. However, it is complex. You know, a lot of farms aren't set up to utilise that. Uh, one of my friends installed it recently, he had to spend two days taking photos of the different udders of 300 cows because the robot has to know where to place the, uh, the cups on the teats. So, you know, it's, 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 still a bit comp it's still a bit complex, it's still in, in its infancy. But, you know, that's the type of thing that we're trying to deal with is that we've got, we've got old technologies which are superseded, uh, we've got new technologies which are standing there. But then we've got this one that we're trying to, the incumbent, that we're trying to uh, replace because, well, this one here, it might replace, but when we're talking about an environmental improvement, we're trying to actually displace an incumbent which might be less environmentally friendly. This example here is the rotary shed, very suitable for milking large herds. I think 40, about 45% of New Zealand herds now are milk using that technology. But to displace it, uh, very difficult because a lot of people have learned how to use it, and it's already there. And what makes things hard is that when we have an incumbent technology, it's very hard, very hard to replace it, even for things that you would think are disruptive technologies. So th this graph here shows the tractor, uh, the adoption of the tractor in, in the USA. So in 1910, there was still a lot of uh, horses and donkeys being used to pull the uh, being used to pull the plow. But it took 60 years for the tractor use to increase 80 percent saturation across the population. And across that, there was many things had to happen. There was laws introduced to change land tenure. There was market and technical development, uh, market, market changes. There was technical innovation in arable crops. But there was also technical innovation in the tractor and, the, uh, and also the implements used alongside the tractor. And so, you know, a disruptive technology such as the tractor replacing the horse still took 60 years, uh, 60 years to happen. But once it did, it was amazing because uh, what you see through the 30s, 40s and 50s is that you actually had a lot of African-American people who had got given land after the Civil War uh, displaced because people now could harvest, uh, harvest 200 acres with a tractor instead of uh, 40 acres with his mule. And so you see a large urban migration around that time to Detroit uh, from displaced cotton farmers because of the tractor moving to Detroit. So you know, there's massive social uh, upheaval as well that goes with this kind of uh, technical innovation and its adoption. Uh, one thing which also makes uh, the adoption of new farming systems that are more conservation, uh, conservation that are better for the environment is also the fact that we have what economists call sunk costs. Uh, every economics professor will tell you sunk costs don't matter. You know, if you've spent money in the past and it's spent now, don't worry about it. However, in reality, it's a bit different. You know, we, uh, if you've bought a dairy farm for $7 million and it's humming along and, and, and to improve the environment, you have to do something different, which might mean you lose some value in your asset. So you no longer have a $7 million dairy farm, but a $3 million dairy farm or a $2 million sheep farm. You know, there's, we get strong, strong uh, there is strong resistance uh, to that. Another point is actually learning as well, is that when we have incumbent ways of farming, uh, what, what's engrossed within them is actually low cost ways of production. Like when we grow, when we're, like I spoke earlier about my, my great great grandfather, and he grazed sheep, and he grazed sheep just like my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father. Uh, you know, we've all we've grazed sheep, and we've learned through doing that. Granddad taught my father how to farm. My father taught me how to farm. You know, it's just something that's ingrained within us. If we want to do something different, then it's actually higher and ha higher cost for us. It's harder for us because we have to learn new ways of farming. And the older we get as farmers, uh, the older we get, the sometimes less, uh, less keen we are to learn these new ways. So we can actually have this kind of strong inertia to change. So when we're trying to think about environmentally friendly farming systems, we're up against it because not only does it, not only do people have uh, a lot of money tied up in the game, uh, a lot of skin in the game, I've heard people call it, a lot of farmers call it skin in the game, but also uh, if, we want to use, if we want to focus on new ways of farming, uh, also we've got We've got to learn how to do it, which is a cost. 
Another fact is that, uh, I'm sorry, this one's a bit hard to see, but another one that's quite difficult is that, uh, is that a lot of our contaminant loss problems are hard to change on the farm. So we've got E. coli losses from sheep farms. Uh, per hectare, they're about, can be 10 times higher for a sheep farm than for a dairy farm. So we've got quite a problem. And what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of uh, fecal microbes or the amount of dung going from a sh uh, an area of sheep farm into a stream. And we, we just did a small workshop with farmers trying to understand, you know, what are these, uh, what are these different options and how do you perceive them? And when I showed up, I think they almost had a noose set up because uh, the, the briefing they got before the meeting is that we've got someone from government coming to tell you to fence your creeks. And so, uh, yeah, I, I could smell a bit of burning. I think they were burning an effigy behind the uh, meeting board. <laughs> And they had a loose setup, but in any case, it was we actually half the time it was just like showing them, no, no, we're actually here to work with you. Uh, but and you know, and that I just used what you know, used the framework I was talking about before. We had profit on the top, loss on the bottom, low complexity and high complexity, and we talked about what are these different things we can get that we can use to get the sheep away from the creek. We can uh, put a water source; they don't have to drink out of the creek anymore. We'll put water over here. Uh, we can change it to forestry, land use change. We don't have sheep even in these, around these streams. Uh, we can fence the stream itself, which is, you know, spoken is quite a broad, it's quite broadly spoken on as litigation. Uh, or also we can put a crossing, you know, build a little bridge so that sheep can walk across that, doesn't have to walk down through, this, through the stream. So those ways of reducing the connectedness between the livestock and the stream. And, you know, and so we spoke about all of those, and then we just put them up on the wall. And what you see, you see there's a quite a strong, there's a few options that are profitable and low complexity, which is the ones we want, the win-wins, or the, the ones that we're hoping can be easily adopted. But really what we see is a skewing down, or an aggregation or accumulation down in this southeast quadrant of loss and, of a loss in profit and complex, uh, and com complex for the farming system itself. And if you look at this countryside, it is a bit like that, you know, it is, it's difficult to see how we can reduce that connectedness. And so, you know, that kind of adds to the complexity of the problem uh, when we're trying to think about these, uh, extending these new farming systems across the landscape. Uh, another, another point is that a lot of actions that we have on farm are beneficial for society, but not for the farmer. So they might be beneficial or might have limited benefit for a farmer. So they have a high public benefit, but not a high private benefit. So we're starting to see, especially in the Waikato now, quite high investment in wetlands. You know, wetlands really are you know, some people call them the, uh, the, you know, the kidneys of the landscape. I've heard someone call them, you know, they help to cleanse, uh, cleanse all the bad things that we do all around them. But, uh, and they really are, you know, they can capture the sediment, they can denitrify the nitrogen, so send it to the atmosphere. Uh, and also sometimes they might lead to the loss of E. coli as well, the microbes uh, manage those. And so the wetland is actually quite a positive. This one here has just been built, so there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of, vegetation growth to go forward. But that can be quite expensive, it can be $100,000, $200,000 for a nice wetland, uh, and the amount of profit that it's going to increase your farm by, it's not going to increase profit on your farm, probably, it's not going to increase it by much at all, uh, if, if at all. And so that highlights, uh, highlights one point, a lot of people have said, you know, can we, is there a way that we can help uh, put public money towards encouraging those options? And so I think the Waikato is one of the, uh, very good example of that, the Waikato River Authority has been funding wetland development uh, throughout, uh, throughout farming areas. Another option is uh, forest, uh, production a for production forest. Um, so we've seen across New Zealand quite a strong recommendations to plant extensive areas of forest to reduce uh, sediment loss, nitrogen loss, phosphorus loss. Um, but at the same time, that changes the dynamic of, if, if you've got a debt, if you've got a farm debt, that's quite, uh, that's quite high, planting forest can be quite detrimental to that because you're not going to get paid for it for another 20 to 30 years. But there's hope that maybe the carbon payments, carbon payments is going to help offset that. Uh, offset that. And so, I, you know, really what I think, so when we think about that, we start thinking about the adoptability of New Zealand's uh, practices to improve the environmental footprint of our farming systems, I think it's actually quite a difficult story. I think the adoption is a really hard, uh, the adoptability of these really good practices is quite low, uh, generally, but you know, I, I don't think that's really, uh, really, that that's not telling us that we shouldn't do the journey. I just think it's really saying that we need to be uh, very wise about how we step in the journey. Um, 
So we were watching, my wife and I were watching uh, Married at First Sight last night, which was a high quality TV program on one of the channels. <laughs> And uh, I saw they had this. They had this quote too. So I thought I'm on the. Uh, I thought if they had it on there, then I'm in. I'm in high quality company anyway. <laughs> uh, a woman had that on her. Uh, had this quote as well up on up on her wall. And that's what really I've been starting to think about. You know what we have is that if we really want to get our water, improve our water quality to quite an aspirational state, it's quite far from where we are now because we've developed for 150 years, 200 years on the back of the grazing animal. The grazing animal is not a terribly efficient way of producing the product. And so really, it's going to take us a while to transition towards a uh, pristine reality or a better reality, one that better trades off economic outcomes with uh, water outcomes. And so really, I think that's the challenge to economists, is that how do we plan that journey? And really, how do we start thinking about those steps? And you know, and that's what I spent the last six months working on just in the spare time, is that starting to think about the journeys and the reason why these journeys are important is because of uncertainty. Uh, you know, like I was, I don't know, I think it was about six months ago, I was quite happy with things were going on in my life, and my, I think my wife had three heart attacks uh, before the last professorial lecture, and all of a sudden, uh, it just came out of nowhere, and that changed things, you know? <laughs> and so things just change. And it's the same when we're talking about farming systems. If we're trying to assess environmental policy, the world how we see it now is going to be different from what it is in a year. And in five years' time, the technologies we have to mitigate environmental, um, to mitigate against environmental impacts will be different. In another 10 years, they'll be different again. You know, we might, we might be a Manuka honey, uh, we might be the Manuka honey capital of the world, we might be planting dairy farms to Manuka, manuka bushes. Uh, we don't know. And that's what the nature of the world is, that it's highly uncertain. And it's how we respond to that uncertainty. And that's what I think a very pragmatic way of designing policy is that step. You know, so rather than thinking about rather than thinking about that long journey, is that, you know, how do economists really think about those next steps? And this is, I've, you know, the more reading I've done and the more talking I've done uh, with my colleagues, is that really this is what we're missing. It's quite a, somebody came up with this 100 years ago and economists have basically ignored it for 100 years. It's known as the diffusion curve, which is this is the population using the technology and this is the number of, ye of years that it takes for the population using the technology to increase. What we see is that usually at first when a new technology comes in, uh, it takes some, some years, some time to get a critical mass, then we find quite a rapid uptake through here, and then we find a leveling off. And this here, what we find is we, we reach our capacity after 15 years, and then 100% of the uh, people who can adopt the technology are using it. However, there are diffusion curves for all types of technology and they're highly different, uh, but some can be rapidly adopting. So if I drew one for mobile phones, it would go up here. They've said they've been very rapidly adopted within a five-year period, for example, they're diffused very quickly. Uh, whereas some might diffuse and then go off there, for example, a, uh, for example wetlands, uh, adoption of wetlands without uh, high public investment is predicted to increase slowly up to about 10% over a 20 to 25 year period. So you know, really the diffusion curve is something that we don't treat much in economics, but really what it does is it, it encapsulates, it captures a lot and describes a lot about adoptability. And that adoptability is important because if we can design farming systems or ways of farming that spread across a landscape, basically that's our uh, environmental problem solved. And what I like about when we start to think about diffusion is that uh, what, it, what it does is start it kind of changes our mindset away from trying to focus on really large improvements far in the future. What we're thinking about is what can we do now? So what we've seen in the last decade, we've seen incredible investment by the dairy industry in fencing our streams, uh, in fencing streams on dairy farms. You know, there is contention about the, uh, about the usefulness of it and the environmental efficacy. You know, it's by far, it's not, I don't think it's by far the most effective mitigation for all contaminants. However, it's pretty good. And, the thing is, is that the dairy industry said, you haven't got a choice, you've got to do it. As an industry, they said that. And so you actually got a very strong focus on adoption within the industry. Same on, uh, same on hill country within our beef and lamb, beef and lamb NZ, who are the sector, the sector representatives for the beef and lamb industry, are focused on land environment planning. So how do we work with farmers to actually uh, farm to the country better? What we see here is actually sector initiatives to try and um, sector initiatives to try and improve the environmental footprint of their farming system. 
And, you know, some people say they're not good enough, they're not far enough. In terms of environmental improvement, they might not get us all the way. But, you know, when, I, when we start thinking about stages on a journey, surely I think this is actually the start of a journey. Like, if we're promoting those steps, then that's a pretty good way. And especially because we're working together, we're not arguing, we're not going, uh, you know, these are things which the industry is saying we should really do. And if we can get on top of, you know, if we can really uh, encourage that, I think that's a really good way of getting momentum uh, on that policy journey. So, in some recent work, uh, in some recent work, I focused on uh, clarity objectives for a community. So, at the site, they had uh, a, a current clarity of about half a metre, and then they were focused on trying to double that to one metre. And so, I actually said, you know, let's try and model it over time. Let's try and think about if we were going to maximise the benefits maximise the benefits in terms of, terms of recreational use, but minimise the cost uh, to reach those objectives, how do we do that across time? And I said, we've got 30 years to do it in, uh, what are we doing? So I started thinking about that time path. And you know, what's fascinating is that we actually see that adoption comes into it. Once we start thinking about adoption, we can actually see, we can start thinking about transition and staging. So dairy fencing, dairy fencing is by no means the best way to reduce <coughs> sediment loss. However, within this catchment, stream bank sediment loss is very high. And so because of the high adoptability of this stream bank fencing on a dairy farm, and because of the cheap, because it can be done cheaply, you actually find we have a strong focus on getting that quickly, is that we should fence as many streams as we can within the first 10 years of our policy. And then with, with also in, within the catchment, we have very soft uh, sandstone uh, hills. With, ex with extensive hill country sheep based on there. So after we've done that, after we've got the low hanging fruit, let's go for the next low hanging fruit. And that's what it's actually, that's what I really like about it is when we start to think about staging, it's like the low hanging fruit. We, first of all, we just stand there and pick the low hanging fruit and we might get a low ladder and get the next one. You know, we're not trying to go right to the top of the tree right from the start, we're not trying to cut the tree down. We're just saying, let's work with people to make those positive steps. And this was one way and this was one way of just trying to think about how do we stage these, uh, this economic analysis across time. And it's totally different from the standard way. This blue box here is how we would model it in the standard way in New Zealand. We would model it basically at year 25. So we'd run a model for one year, we wouldn't study the transition, we'd just say in year 25 you need to have all of your dairy, dairy streams fenced. Uh, each farm should have a farm plan to focus on where they can reduce sediment loss. And you might want to sheep, uh, fence some of the fence some of the streams on your sheep farms as well. So as you see, you know, if this is the traditional way you're modelling, then what you're missing out is the journey. So rather than thinking of a policy, you know, rather than having an economics that focuses on a single point of time or an equilibrium that doesn't exist, why don't we focus on that transition and say, you know, what is that optimal transition or what is those stages on that journey? How do we get that going? And, and you know, another exciting thing I think is that once we start thinking about journeys, is that we can actually start thinking about futures as well. So one of my friends has been involved uh, in leading a project at Dairy and Z uh, called Leap 21. And so what they've done there is that we've got representatives from the dairy sector, they've gone out to, uh, representatives from the dairy sector have gone out and spoken to Fonterra dairy farmers, uh, Ministry for the Environment, uh, environmental groups, Ministry for Primary Industries and trying to see what do the stakeholders want from our dairy industry in New Zealand. And then they've said, let's imagine, you know, let's try to think about how we can design a farming system to meet those objectives. So we're actually trying to reimagine those futures, reimagine those alternative futures. And then because once we once we design those futures, we can start thinking about pathway, pathways to get there. And I've been involved, this was one of the more exciting meetings I've been at. This was held in a uh, in Gisborne in an early childcare centre. We met with a few farmers to discuss microbial losses from farms. And so this is New Zealand's, probably one of the world's experts in E. coli sitting next to the, uh, sitting next to the play oven there. <laughs> <laughs> and right, and some of the kids came along and it was, you know, he, he was interrupted by screams through the whole meeting. And, but, you know, we're working two projects in the Hawke's Bay now to try and think about how do we think about these new farming systems. You know, like, let's just forget, like, we, in a new farming system we might not even need a grazing animal might not need a grazing cow to produce milk. You know, what is the future? And then once we design those futures, how can we get there? So really trying to just start with a blank, 
start with a blank canvas and start to think about these alternative futures. So really, that's uh, that's kind of you know been a, that's really well, tonight. That's where I want to end my journey. You know, my journey that has been my talk. Uh, you know, at the start, my father, like when I spoke about my father improving my writing and then slowly building from there, it was like one of those diffusion curves. We started small and we got bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, really what he said there is just let's just do what we know how to do. Uh, let's do something safe. Uh, let's do something that we know that we know is not going to work against us. Let's start out. Let's do it small. You know, we don't have to change the world in a day, but we have to make a direction. We've got to be safe and secure in our direction. And I think, you know, I think it's exciting where in time as a society, New Zealand's really uh, dynamic in the way we think about policy. And I think what's really exciting is to be an economist immersed in that environment and start thinking how as a profession we can really provide uh, input into planning those policy journeys. So thank you very much. And uh, it's been great having this opportunity. Thanks a lot. My name's Deborah Willis, I'm the Acting Dean of the Management School, and it's my very great pleasure to thank Graham for his lecture. Um, now I know many of you have been to a number of inaugurals before, but for those of you who perhaps have not, the, one of the key roles, or the key role of inaugural is to sh showcase excellent research and to present it to an educated audience. And part of the task is to make this relevant, to make research relevant. And some lecturers struggle with this topic, um, not the case today. Uh, certainly, I think Graham's lecture is a textbook case of how academic research can uh, make a difference to all of us. It's an area that's moving quickly. Um, the discourse around land use and the environment is it's a controversial one, but it's certainly a very important one. And water is clearly right in the centre of, of that discussion. It's obviously not without its controversy. I think Graham's description of a perhaps slightly tense <laughs> encounter of having one or two encounters with farmers until they sort of got your measure. Um, it was, was certainly interesting. And it's a very clearly a long-term project involving collaboration with government, industry leaders, scientists, and of course farmers. Um, I was particularly struck by the inclusion of the word people in the title of the lecture. Um, this is clearly a, a project that's seeking behavioural change. And when you put people at the centre, you need to recognise that these things take time. Um, so it's not going to be easy, it's obviously a long-term journey but that's, that's still in, in progress, um, but I think it'll be, it'll be worth it in the end. So thank you, Graham, for your lecture. It's been an interesting lecture, timely, relevant and important, not just for our region, but also more, much more broadly than that. So thank you, and please join me in thanking Graham one more time, and also outside for drinks and some more conversation. <laughs>